Dun, dun. All right, let's make sure we are live. This takes a second to kick in here. Um, hope you're doing well. Uh, thanks for joining me today on this mm -hmm. next rendition of uh, Zephyr 101. Um, we'll be talking about Watchdog, multi-developer projects, kind of keeping those sane. Um, so, oop. All right, let's make sure we are live. And it's coming over on my phone, so that means we're good. Good to go. We're going to jump in. Um, if you haven't already, uh, hit that subscribe button, the like button, all those buttons. Um, in particular, I'd love to get your feedback, all the things that you'd like to see me do here, what you'd like to see me cover, um, because particularly this week is going to be all questions from the community over the past couple weeks. Um, so I turn those questions into these videos. So if you have questions, leave them in the comments below. Let me know, and uh, we'll, we'll cover it here. And um, I send out emails about an hour before these live streams uh, generally. So if you'd like to get that heads up beforehand, um, you can just, just join my, uh, my mailing list at jerrybolt.com. It should be right on the homepage there. You just type your email, your name, and you'll be on the list. So this week, the first question is from Chris. Um, are there any examples of implementing a watchdog? And I think there are some Zephyr... Uh, samples of setting up a watchdog, but I just, I'll run through kind of the basics of uh, what's necessary. So, jump back here. So uh, for high uh, reliability applications, so things that you're, you, you, you want to make sure your processor is never locked up or anything, anything's bad has happened to it. Um, and generally you'd like to test it beforehand to make sure it doesn't do those things, but um, for the super paranoid, you always want to implement the watchdog. It's a, and essentially, if you don't know what a watchdog timer is, it's an internal timer that resets the device unless um, it's the, the counter, the internal counter is reset before expiry. So I'll kind of get into that. But the idea is there's this timer, and if it expires, it'll reset your device. And it's kind of a safety mechanism to make sure everything's working properly. And for high availability slash, you know, high, you know, Things you don't want it to lock out, uh, you want to make sure it's, you know, if there's any type of halt or anything, you don't want it to reset it every single time. Um, so those are important things uh, to think about. If for your own project, you want to make sure that uh, if you're very concerned about reliability or, you know, make sure that it's going to be working over time. Um, like tracking applications, you want it to work. You don't want it to lock up and then you don't, you lose all the data that, you know, from A to B. So important concept. Uh, we'll be going over the focus ma mainly on the NRF 9160, the 52 chips. Um, I think all NRF 50 or NRF chips have a watchdog timer, so uh, you don't have to add any external parts. It's all internal. And uh, for these chips in particular, I know that so the watchdog API support is there. And uh, for others, most likely too, I know SDM32s have watchdog timers other chips, probably the um, uh, microchip, the uh, Atmel chips all have uh, watchdog timers. I think it's just built into the uh, ARM, to ARM uh, architecture. And uh, if you only, it only takes a little bit to set up, so we should be able to get it running pretty fast. And of course, configurations. Um, this one's pretty simple. And uh, it's just simply enabling watchdog. Now, if you have an external watchdog, maybe Ashford C or a Spy or UART, then that you'll have to turn on that stuff. But in this case, just turning it on uh, will turn on the internal watchdog stuff. As you can see, I, I dove into the, the chip definitions to actually find whether or not the watchdog timer is enabled by default. The top one is, I think they're nearly identical. Um, but the, te the top one is NR52840, the bottom one is NR91 enabled by default. If you look at that status, Okay, that means it's enabled by default. So, oh, it looks like I'm having issues with my stream. Let me know in the comments if uh, my stream is not coming over. Okay, might have to restart it. I don't know what's going on. Technical difficulties, everyone. Live streams. Hmm. Oh, I think we're back. Okay. Zoom back into the slideshow here. So yeah, what I was saying is 
The if you look at these guys, the top one is the NR52, the NRF91. They're both enabled by default, so you don't have to do anything else in your uh, in your overlays or anything like that. Then simply uh, grab that device, so the watchdog timer. We're using the device DT get, so this will actually get it at compile time rather than at runtime. Uh, and generally, if you have a watchdog timer uh, labeled WT, uh, WDT0, uh, if it doesn't find it, you'll get some errors at compilation time. So, And in general, um, when you you just check and make sure it's like ready and there's no problems, um, this is most of the time, you're not going to have these problems. Um, but it's always good to check. This is generally more useful for instances where uh, you have a device that maybe is communicating over a bus. Maybe it's not there. Maybe it's not connected. Maybe it's not powered properly. So that that particular check is more useful. But uh, I always add it in there for, for sanity. Then you can see the configuration, the watchdog timer configuration. Uh, what you want it to do in that flags. So you reset the SOC, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think there are some other options. And uh, then in that window.max, that's actually your max time and you know, that's your timeout essentially in milliseconds. So that's the that's the window you want to set to make sure that the device, like for me, I've set things to 10, uh, 10 seconds, so it's 10,000 milliseconds. And then I've set a tick timer, which I'll show you in a second, uh, to like five seconds. Um, but it's really dependent on your application. If you have a more, um, a an application where you want to make sure it's running at milliseconds or microseconds, and you have to decrease that window uh, for sure. And, and then uh, all you have to do is install that timeout. So we set the configuration, so we want to install it. And this is required before you actually um, start the timer itself. Uh, and uh, you have to make sure you're tracking that WDT channel ID because you'll be there are options like pausing, um, for especially, especially during debug, things like that. So. Um, you can set those options if you want to, especially if you're debugging, but uh, not necessary every time. If you want it just to reset, reset, even if you are debugging, then you can change or remove that option. Dun, dun, dun. And then uh, importantly is that feed function. So you have to call this within your code periodically, and you can see that I'm using that WDT channel ID. Um, that's important. We're calling the peripheral and the channel ID because you can have multiple channels. And uh, what I've done is I t usually create some type of timer. I called this one the tick timer and the tick timer handler. And I'm using that to basically send an event to the main thread to uh, feed the watchdog timer. And I'll show you that in a second. So here's the tick timer handler. Should look familiar for everybody here who's done anything with timers. You can see the app event manager. Uh, I'm pushing that tick event. And then later on in the main loop, I'm handling that tick event by just feeding the timer. And in that, this um, app underscore watchdog feed is just basically that function. It's just a wrapper around the original API. So remember, um, you just want to make sure that you place the feed function in the <laughs> in the thread that you most care about. If you place it in something that um, it's just going to run all the time, then it's never going to help you uh, detect anything where it's locking up. Typically, it's going to be the main function, the main thread, so it's completely up to you. Um, but ultimately, you want to find out why, why that thread is locking up versus uh, putting in the watchdog timer. The watchdog timer is not a solution. It's just like a reliability thing when you're extremely paranoid, like your application should work without this. Uh, and um, obviously, it's the timeout is, is application dependent, so it's all up to your what you think is uh, right from what you can see in your application what the timeout and the tick and the uh, how often you feed that timer so next question how to make a zephyr sub module or dependencies in the main app development so this is for multi-developer projects and this question is from trevor and uh, my solution for this is always the the Zephyr made this really easy with the West Manifest. OS Manifest. Some of you are used to like get sub sub modules or things like that, and you can kind of use it along with the West Manifest. But to track and configure a project, especially for multiple developers or multiple you know multiple people, um, highly 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 recommend just setting up a West Manifest for your project, initializing your project that way. 
Uh, that way you don't have to worry about someone pulling in the wrong version of say like NCS or something like that. While the Nordic Connect SDK or the Nordic Connect uh, desktop tools are great and they make it really easy to set up the SDK, uh, it also makes it difficult to make sure everybody's in sync if you're using NCS across multiple developers, because who knows, like someone might be on 1.9.1 versus 1.9, uh, 2.0. Uh, there's a lot of breaking changes in 2.0, so it probably wouldn't work anyway, but uh, these, this is important. And the biggest thing you can do is just track those dependencies in your West manifest. So I'll show you what that looks like here. Uh, this is, um, and I've also included a link to this in the description along with the um, the code for the watchdog stuff. That's one thing I didn't mention. Is uh, everything's in the description below, so you can you know you can click into it and see the details. I'm only going over the highlights, the important parts, so you can check it out there. But here's the West uh, manifest for one particular project. You see, I can pull in the remote for uh, Zephyr. I'm pulling in version three of Zephyr. And th this is how I'm pulling in Zephyr. This is one of the requirements of the project. And actually I have some other sub dependencies. This is for the air quality wing sample. You can see I'm pulling in drivers. Um, there's another dependency, including the URL, the revision. Um, you can see I'm importing any other sub dependencies. That's important. And I think I did not include it on this one because there was a bunch of other um, important sub dependencies, but pretend that it's there. And then um, like, for instance, like here's another dependency, which is Goliath. And I just added that guy um, importing for, they have their own um, two different versions of uh, their West manifest. So you just gotta make sure you point to the right one. There's one for NCS and one for, uh, one for Zephyr, or just vanilla Zephyr. So those are important things to know. Uh, but whenever you change that underlying dependency, basically it's up to you to communicate that change to your teammates so they know like, okay, I just needed to run a West update. Uh, and then another great kind of sanity check, obviously, is always to keep, you have, if you have CI building in the background, that's great to make sure you're not breaking anything. But the biggest thing is to communicate, either pay attention to your West YAML, you know, West manifests, see if there's any changes when you pull things in, or just communicate it when you actually make those changes, because those will affect your teammates down the road. So it's like, hey, I just updated NRF Connect SDK. Hey, I just updated Zephyr to a new version, make sure you guys pull a West, you know, do a West update, make sure you're in sync. Um, those, those are the best, the best ways to do is just like communication, plain old communication. Uh, come on, slideshow. Um, and it can be done with um, NRF SDK or NRF Connect SDK as well, actually. Happened. It's skipping ahead. So it, all you have to do is change your Zephyr requirement to NCS. So it's the same entry, but it's just different values. So you're you're using a different remote probably, and also changing the name of the project. You know the repo path, remotes, things like that. For this guy, you're actually pulling a version of Zephyr but it's actually a sub-dependency of NRF Connect SDK. So all you have to do is make sure you include that in port true, and that will include all the sub-dependencies of NRF SDK and then Zephyr therefore. So that's really great because when people get started with NRF Connect SDK, maybe they're under, under the assumption that, oh, I need to use the NRF Connect SDK setups a desktop stuff so it'll, it'll live in a completely different place on my computer but that's not necessarily the case and if if you're like me who have I, I have like four or five different projects on my machine that all use different versions of Zephyr um, it's great to have that one version but I like to keep everything kind of version and untouched and if you have a project that has the same version like oh well it's gonna be there in another folder but that's the way that way you can keep it sane because if you have multiple versions of NCS, it's hard to switch between the two. So just something to keep in mind. I mean, you'll find your own uh, methods and how to keep things in sync. But again, I highly, highly recommend using West Manifest because that's that's just the way that um, 
the Zephyr team have developed how to work with Zephyr and it just makes it a lot easier to control those dependencies versus pulling it separately, pointing to it, or using um, environment variables and things like that. It's all done for you. And jump back. So my preferred way, I kind of mentioned that, and then uh, make sure you, know, you monitor it and, make sure, and then make any communications that you need to to your team to let them know that you've made changes to the manifest as well. Usually it's pretty obvious because if you, for instance, if you, if you make any upgrades to a different version of Zephyr, most likely there's going to be breaking API changes. So when someone tries to build the old version, they haven't done the West update, they're going to get breaking, you know, they're going to get breaking um, messages during compilation versus if they kind of pay attention and update their West manifest and they upgrade, update all the dependencies, they're not going to run into those issues. So that's another creative way to do it is just <laughs> is uh, to make sure that they're running the right version is just, Hey, I also at the same time, usually that's what happens is you update the AP, the version of Zephyr and boom, um, you're also updating different parts of your application, which is using different APIs. Maybe the API has changed for certain things. So that's a good way to remind people, hey, update your West manifest. So that's it for this one. Um, it's a quickie, but uh, I really appreciate y'all being here. Um, more content coming soon, obviously, but only with your help. So please drop me a line, let me know in the comments below uh, the things that you'd like to see me cover because I'd like to answer your questions. Um, also check out the uh, form community.jerobo.com. That's where a lot of folks come in and ask questions. Actually, I, some of these questions actually came from there. Um, I don't know if I have the link to it, but it should be in the description. And that's it for today. So really appreciate you being here and 